Our job as storyboard artists is not to illustrate the script, but to translate it. I'm Doug Leffler, and this is Storyboarding as I Know and Practice It. Consider this line in French. And for any native French speakers, please forgive my pronunciation. Mon chien me manque. It means, I miss my dog. But in French, you express it in a different way than we do in English. It's more like, my dog is by me missed. If you were to take a French-English dictionary and faithfully swap each French word for an English word, you would come up with something like, my dog me miss which might get across the idea, but doesn't do justice to the sentiment. This is what happens in storyboarding when we faithfully draw everything that's in the script. We might be fulfilling our obligations, but we're not doing justice to the audience. Let me take you back to ancient times. In 1995, I was dividing my time between Los Angeles, California, and Auckland, New Zealand. I was working on Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, and Xena, Warrior Princess. I was working as a writer, a director, and a storyboard artist. One of the episodes I did was titled King of Thieves, and I wrote and directed it. Now, my job as a writer was to get the script approved to go into production. And in order to accomplish that, I had to first come up with a good idea. I had to populate it with interesting characters. And I had to give the story its structure and its dialogue. A screenplay has often been referred to as a blueprint for a movie. I don't think that this is entirely accurate. A screenplay is more like an artist's rendering of what the building's going to be. And I say that because a blueprint is a very technical document. But a screenplay must be understood by everybody. So not just the filmmakers, but the producers, the studio executives, the parents of the lead actor. The script has to be digestible by all of these different people in order for it to eventually be approved for production. Once my script was approved for production, I took off my writer's hat and I put on my filmmaker's hat and I began to storyboard. And I immediately found myself cursing the writer for the choices that he had made to make the script readable that I now had to adapt to make it filmable. However, as the writer-director, if I had put in all of the detail that I intended to film into the scene description, it, the script would have been so dense that it would have been unreadable and it wouldn't have uh, fulfilled its primary function. So the main takeaway here is that when you storyboard, don't just storyboard for your employer. Don't just fulfill your obligation to draw everything that's mentioned in the script, but always storyboard for the audience. You wanna make sure that the audience is getting the experience that the script intended. Let's look at a practical application of translating from the written page uh, to the visual language. Assume I have my writer's cap on and I've written the following scene. Interior kitchen, early morning. The sun filters through the open window. A cat jumps onto the table where a steaming cup of coffee sits next to a freshly poured bowl of milk and cereal. Toast pops in the toaster. A golden retriever stands over the body of a man on the floor. The dog moves closer to sniff the knife protruding from his master's back. He looks up at the cat and whines in desperation. The cat turns away and starts to lap at the milk in his dead master's cereal bowl. All right, so as a writer, I am using a progression of information that I'm spoon feeding to you to hopefully build your interest in the scene. So this is we're looking at a crime that has just been committed. Uh, we know it's just been committed because coffee is still steaming, the toast has just popped from the toaster. And I've presented this information in a linear fashion to you. However, if I were to draw it, you would basically see everything at once. This is the difference between the written language and the visual language. Now, there's an easy way in this case to translate it, which would be to create a series of shots that uh, replicates the progression of information that, as it was written in the script. Now, to do that, for instance, I might start on a shot with the toaster and the toast popping. Now, this wasn't the way it was written in the script, but the toast popping makes a good cutting point to come into the scene. And then using cinematic language, we would see perhaps the cat enter the shot 
which would motivate us to track and follow the cat to the edge of the table, where we could reveal the cereal bowl and the steaming cup of coffee. On the background of the shot, we might see the dog enter the scene. Now, this is all still one shot that we're playing with. And we would continue this shot then as we would move over the edge of the table and the camera could boom up and look down at the floor. Here we would get our first glimpse of a body lying there, but we don't know what's happened to the body yet. Now from here, we can cut down to the dog. This would be our first cut, so we're on shot number two. And we're pulling the camera forward with the dog as he comes forward. And the dog leads us to the knife protruding from the man's back. So now we know a murder has occurred. Dog sniffs the knife. And then the dog looks up at the cat on the table and whines pathetically. And in this case, then, the button to the scene is that the cat just could care less and just turns and starts lapping at the milk in the cereal bowl. All right, so let's look at another example. Exterior village. The horsemen crash into the marketplace, taking the villagers by surprise. So this last part of the sentence, taking the villagers by surprise, is that kind of an afterthought in the way it's written. But it seems to me like that's where the greatest emotion is going to be found. So we could just draw this again, a wide shot of the village with the horsemen crashing through the marketplace, overturning tables and knocking down stalls, uh, and see the villagers fleeing in panic. And that would tell the story. And if this event happens later in the story, that's probably a perfectly valid way of doing it. However, if it happens earlier and you're trying to set up the world and the environment, I might suggest something like this, where we would start on a child, a young girl, who sees something off camera. We don't know what it is, but hopefully we're curious as to what she's reacting to. Well, in the background, we see her mother bartering with a grocer. And we see some visual information about the village that surrounds them. Then the girl could cross over, uh, motivating us to pan. And in doing so, we can see some more visual information about the village and the villagers going about their daily lives. While at the same time, hopefully building our curiosity as to what it is that she's seen. Uh, and now we follow her around where she uh, approaches a stall that has a lot of hand-painted pottery. And she takes a large, pretty hand-painted pot off of one of the high shelves. So as the uh, young girl is admiring the handiwork that went into making this pot, we can see her mother react. She turns and sees what her daughter's holding. The mother comes forward, takes the pot from the child, and then we see the mother dutifully replace the pot on the high shelf of the stall with the rest of the buttery. Then as a woman turns away, we can linger on the pots. And in the cinematic language, when you hold on something, you're expecting something to happen. And when you hold on something and nothing happens, it builds tension. It makes us think well, something is going to occur. It, uh, and we're waiting to find out what it is. So then from here, we can see the woman turn uh, uh, probably to reprimand her daughter for uh, picking up a pot that was fragile and perhaps expensive. 
But now the little girl is startled by something. and We hear a sound that we can't identify. The mother becomes aware of it too. We cut back to the pots and now we see that they begin to rattle dangerously and they're being uh, unbalanced onto the shelves. And then we see the pots come crashing down to break against the hard packed earth. From here, the camera can pan up quickly to the woman who grabs her daughter protectively uh, in a state of panic, uh, as we now hear off screen sound of horsemen. And now we can cut wide to see the horsemen crashing into the village. So this is obviously a uh, made up example, but it's very much like the kind of thing that I would draw and propose to the filmmakers. And it's, you know, it's useful to have me spend an hour exploring a potential idea like this than for them to have to spend uh, a day or two filming it. In conclusion, to be an effective translator, you need to be fluent in the source language and in the target language. So in this case, in the written language of the script and in the visual language of cinema. Now, an argument could be made that it's not the storyboard artist's job to translate, that that's the director's job, and well, that's not wrong. However, I believe you can be a better storyboard artist if you do understand the translation process. If you have any thoughts, please share them in the comments section below.